Hello, I'm Solome Tibabu, the host of the Going Digital Behavioral Health Tech Conference. I'm super excited to have Cheryl Wilinski and Dr. Lucy Roberts here from One Digital. Welcome and uh, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Why don't we start with uh, Shira and then Dr. Roberts, if you want to do some quick introductions. Yes, thank you. I am the National Health and Wellbeing Practice Leader with One Digital. I've been with the organization for about three years, and my prior experience includes working with the TPA and completing all of my coursework for my PhD in health services research. Hi, hey, I'm Lucy Roberts, and I just recently joined One Digital about a month ago, um, but my background is actually in educational psychology. Um, and just recently finished my PhD and have worked in the mental health care um, field as a practitioner and a researcher for about eight years. Excellent. She's the credibility to the group. So. <laughs> Yes, wonderful. Well, I'm really excited about this topic. We've got a lot of employers with many questions. Of course, the pandemic has impacted everyone, uh, especially employers and how they're supporting their employees with mental health. Could you talk a little bit about what you're seeing with your clients as it relates to how the pandemic has impacted them? So, may I would say we have seen employers that maybe in the past have dilly-dallied around with liking to think about or talk about health and well-being strategy, but when it comes to actually doing something, maybe being a little bit slack because there are so many other priorities that come up. And what we have seen with the pandemic is this immediate call to action and need to do something. So we have had a lot of our folks looking at what can we do to support our employees right now? I think that the case that we have tried to build for a very long time, that there's no such thing as work-life balance anymore. Uh, it's just all integrated and infiltrated we really did get a major glimpse into the reality of what it means when we say your employees are bringing their whole selves and everything that comes along with them to work every day. Well, speaking of which, um, I, I've heard that frequently. And one thing that comes up often is, okay, lots of employers want to do something all of a sudden, but stigma continues to play a huge role for mental health solutions in the workplace. Do you have any insight on how you're handling that? I will definitely let Lucy chime in, but, but I would say this, for so long, the biggest problem with the stigma is that people really needing help would hesitate to, to ask for help. I think as a result of the pandemic, we don't have that problem anymore. I think for the majority of employees trying to balance all of the challenges of working from home, their family, changes and shifts in their job and responsibilities and technology, for example, for quite some time, employees have really been struggling and suffering and they are asking for help. And um, so it's actually been a bit of a silver lining, I think. And now the opportunity for employers is, what are you gonna do about it? You have a captive audience, you have employees asking for help and now is the time to do something. Lucy, do you wanna chime in? Absolutely, so stigma I mean, is something that has always existed for behavioral health, mental health. Um, and as Shira mentioned, you know, with the pandemic, one of the silver linings have, has been that it is in our faces and we have to deal with it. Um, and so part of the, the trick would then be for leadership to really dive in and say, okay, this is something we have to, to address and have to get really serious about addressing. Um, so I really, I really think that it, it starts with the leadership and being very vulnerable and open and having those conversations, starting to create that, um, that culture in your work supports mental health um, 
whether it's, you know, tangible solutions or whether it is um, even just being able to have those conversations. So while I, I do think the stigma still does exist and will exist to a certain extent, um, I think this is a really great time and opportunity to um, kind of crush it um, even further. So. Yeah, I certainly hope that is one silver lining out of all of this through COVID. But um, so we've been alluding a lot to employer-based mental health solutions. Can you talk more about what are some of the most popular behavioral health uh, programs that you're seeing with your clients? So for several employers, they have access to an EAP built in through other benefits. Um, what we are finding is that it's not enough. So we see employers looking across the scope of mental health and supporting employees through either standalone EAP programs, um, enhancing access to direct virtual care related to mental health, and then also beefing up the tools and resources that they're offering to employees on a day-to-day -day basis to manage stress and cope. Lucy, anything to add from your perspective? Mm -hmm. I, th I think that kind of um, covers the gamut of, of what we're seeing. Um, there's room for improvement, of course, um, but, but yeah, I think that pretty much covers um, what, from my perspective, what I've seen. Great. So let's say I'm an employer that's ready to implement some kind of new behavioral health solution for my employees. What are some major things that I should be looking out for in terms of um, outcomes or quality in advance of procurement? So a couple of things, I think first and foremost is make sure that you're getting the most value out of the resources that you already have in place. So whether it is access to an EAP, maybe it's additional resources available through the medical carrier, make sure that employees know where to find information about the programs and how to access. So maybe it's something that was communicated in open enrollment. What we're telling employers is to communicate again, communicate in a different way and tell them again and again and again to make sure that you're getting value out of what you already have in place. What we're also finding is if you look across your workforce and you see from a diversity perspective, um, a generational perspective, you have so many unique needs of the individuals within your workforce that having one standard solution might not be enough. And there's certainly an opportunity to kind of look at the needs of your population. Um, we do have employers that will offer surveys, um, but also just knowing from a generational perspective and some of what the data tells us in terms of how folks are going to respond the best. Um, we are seeing folks looking to kind of diversify the solutions that, that they're offering. That's such an important point. Not only having different interventions that are appropriate for different people on the team, but also how do you even communicate that they exist what are the different mediums to communicate it so that all employees are reaching that message that these resources are already even there available for them? And if you think about it, when it comes to mental health, all of us are on the spectrum. At any, any given point on any given day, right? So it's it, making sure that we are offering access and support to the people that are really struggling, um, maybe they have a diagnosis or a condition, um, looking at the folks that may have exacerbated their existing condition based on the circumstances. And then those of us that on a day-to-day -day basis are, are looking for, for better ways to cope with all of the unknown that continues to be thrown at all of us. Lucy, additional thoughts? Yeah, you make a great point um, because really mental health um, is not just the, we're not just looking for an absence of illness or an absence of a clinical diagnosis. We are really wanting to um, 
kind of embrace this idea of well-being and of, of um, holistic um, uh, mental health. I mean, in other words, that, that you really want to um, work towards wellness and work towards a thriving life as opposed to just getting by and um and so so really kind of shifting the focus uh, is going to be really important going forward and there are dollars attached to Salome I mean we what we're seeing right now I think is employers looking at it from the perspective of do the right thing um do well as a business by doing good for your employees. But there are also hard dollars attached to um, poor mental health and well-being. It it can translate into 25 to 35% of your payroll. So it is it is something that both from a taking care of your employees perspective as well as succeeding as a business has become really a critical business imperative. This is not something anymore that is kind of getting shoved onto somebody's desk. It is something that even from the most senior leadership perspective, um, we are seeing folks taking an interest and being supportive of, um, of implementing solutions. You mentioned uh, about outcomes. And of course, when it comes to health and well-being programs, no matter what it is that you're putting in place, it's important to kind of determine what does it mean to an employer to be successful. And if you're on the B2B side, um, to know your audience and to understand what does it really mean to them to to have a successful program. So in some cases, it's just being able to say that we offer the support, right? We we offer these resources, we offer the support, not so important to what degree people utilize the program, but we wanna do our part and make sure people know that it's there. In other cases, employers, particularly those that are self-funded, they're looking at it from a medical claims and pharmacy cost and seeing this as one of their top health risk and cost drivers. And they are looking specifically at solutions that can tie back directly to better managing their claims costs. Um, And in other cases, we're seeing it from the perspective of turnover, burnout, um, employees not just being able to show up at work, but being able to be productive. And so I think those are all different opportunities to, to be able to measure the, the impact or define what it would mean to be successful as it relates to a mental health strategy. But we definitely want to be able to have a way to measure it. That's exactly right. Um, now more than ever, employers have to be thinking about these things because of these hard costs that are are truly being impacted. And so, you know, this is a virtual behavioral health tech conference. And what do you think about um, in terms of who, which employees are are best suited to be able to offer something like a behavioral health tech intervention? Yeah. So, Shira, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but I would, I would start, um, I think with the makeup of the, of the company. So it's so important to know who employees are, um, what it, what their needs are. Um, so it kind of goes back to what we've been talking about all along is, is figuring out generational trends, um, figuring out industry trends, um, and kind of be from there. Um, and then you can, kind of decide the best way forward as far as implementing resources um, for your company. I would I would also suggest that as a result of the pandemic, the influx that we've seen in terms of the utilization of telemedicine just in general has been astronomical. I think the last stat I saw was a 2,600% increase in utilization. I'm, I'm sure that it's, it's bigger than that. So all of a sudden, one of the biggest struggles in terms of credibility um, as it relates to telehealth and virtual health 
now is, is really no longer. People have embraced the convenience of it. And I think that opens up a huge door um, when you look at some of the barriers to people really getting the help and support that they need from a mental health perspective as well. Right. Speaking of teletherapy, I mean, now there's, there's telepsychiatry, there's therapy, there's peer support, coaching. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what employers should consider in terms of offering some or all of those? I would say certainly to, to again, make sure that you are addressing the entire spectrum. So those that are struggling and suffering, those that need support managing um, perhaps a condition, and then those on a day-to-day -day basis. So that can come in the form of having multiple different partners, or if you already have certain resources in place, maybe supplementing. And then there's certainly some solutions out there that offer a or at least are attempting to offer a truly integrated approach across the spectrum. Lucy, I know you have quite a bit of experience in kind of sifting through some of the, um, the differences. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there are vendors or companies that are, are attempting to address this mental health um, and behavioral health concern. And but they're all not created equally. They come from different perspectives. Some of them are technology forward. Some of them are um, very um, coaching based um, and they may offer some other things on the side. Really when you're, when you're evaluating what it is that you are hoping to provide, um, you, you want to figure out what it is that, the way that they're going about um, triaging, their um, employees. So when, how does an employee gain access to the resources? What is it that allows them to be um, suggested for coaching or for therapy? Um, you wanna look at the tools that they're offering for self-directed, um, just skill building or day-to-day -day stress management. Um, so you really kind of wanna dig in and, and figure out what it is that, it, that they're offering, but then how are your employees gaining access? Because that has been such a key um, ish for mental health um, services, but you want them to gain the right kind of access to be triaged to the right um, the first time. So that's something to really consider. And just to kind of um, paint a, a specific example. So while you have some opportunities that triage individuals directly to a actual clinical psychologist, um, the benefits there are that you're removing several of the barriers. Somebody is making that very difficult decision to reach out and ask for help. You wanna make it as easy for them as possible. Now, that being said, folks that need help, they don't always need help at that level of care. And so there are other solutions that have more of a, I guess, a stepping stone, if you will, of a process to kind of triage the employee along. So maybe their initial interaction is with a health coach. So pros and cons, right? From a cost perspective, it's going to be much more affordable from the employer perspective. On the con side, you may have some folks that get frustrated that really truly need that clinical support and you've created additional barriers for them to access care. So um, just some things to, to keep in mind. What I would say is, as a takeaway is anything is better than nothing. Um, and if you've been thinking about doing something, um, don't, don't get too caught up in worrying about is it the right solution or not. Certainly um, making sure you're selecting the right solution for your employees, but also make sure that, um, that you don't get too paralyzed by the gamut of choices that are out there. Absolutely. I would second that. <laughs> really good point. It's easy to get overwhelmed with so many options now, um, but we can't let uh, perfect be the enemy of good, which I'm a total hypocrite. That is my thing a lot of the time. Um, so 
you know, we've talked a lot about mental health solutions specifically, but of course, One Digital Health and Wellbeing is doing so much work beyond just that. Can you talk a little bit about beyond the clinical behavioral health solutions that we've discussed so far? What are some of the drivers of stress for employees in general across the spectrum of well-being? So, Lame, if you look at the biggest challenges and distractions for employees from a productivity perspective, there are so many things that contribute to the overall health and well-being and of course, mental health of employees and their ability. We, when we talk about mental health, a lot of times we do get caught up in thinking about um, disorders, for example, or managing stress and anxiety, but there's a whole other piece of it uh, that relates to, uh, call it brain health, right? And particularly from an employer perspective, um, when it comes to doing your job effectively, things like ability to focus, and memory, which we know can be drastically affected by so many other distractions that we all have um, on an ongoing basis. And a big culprit of those right now for many folks is finance. And um, so when we look at mental health, when we look at health and well being, we are encouraging folks to think bigger and broader because. A lot of times a mental health solution is, is really helping employees address their financial stress or helping to address um, family care issues at home, right? And so um, we, we encourage folks to think of all of the different things that contribute to an individual really thriving at work, at home, in their community, and, um, and making sure that you look at, and again, Start with what you've got, because in a lot of cases, you're probably already doing a lot of things to support employees, but it's packaging and positioning them in the context of well-being and supporting individuals in that way. Um, and it, uh, from the other side, if you're looking to kind of appeal to that employer audience to know that there are so many contributing factors uh, when it comes to overall health and well-being and with that comes so many vendor solutions so all of a sudden you're looking at managing my maternity high risk patients and diabetes and sleep and musculoskeletal and financial well-being and of course mental health and so even though everybody's trying to do the same thing at the same time, there is competition for shelf space, right? As it relates to your audience, the buyer, the employer, but also the end user, the employee. There's just only so much capacity, I think, that individuals have to better themselves <laughs> at one time. Which is a really important perspective for a lot of the vendors and startups in the audience that um, they should think about. In fact, do you have any advice for behavioral health startups that they should keep in mind as they attempt to partner with employers? So a couple of things come to mind. Keep it simple. Recognize that it is likely that employers are already going to have something in place. So be thinking about uh, ways to play nicely in the sandbox. And, um, and also, wherever there is opportunity to streamline and simplify, if, if there are opportunities to be addressing all of the different aspects, at least as it relates to supporting mental health, uh, I think that is something truly unique in, in the marketplace, um, but also have that flexibility to, to carve out because what we are finding is that there's a lot of redundancy that employers end up paying for um, a service through another carrier um, in a couple different places. And it's, it's a lost investment. I would add that, um, you know, as I've met with various events, what, one of the first questions I like to ask is, what dif differentiates you? What is different about your particular program or service? And oftentimes they have that answer for you, but then they can weave it, weave it throughout um, their presentation. So it gives you a really good idea about 
what kind of value they would bring. So I think even just starting there is, is a good place um, for when vendors are looking for partnerships. I think the other opportunity right now, Salome, is um, Lucy and I have talked about it quite a bit in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also belonging and the connection with mental health. I, I think that is another area that employers are hungry for in terms of bringing solutions. And there's certainly a huge connection as it relates to the impact on mental health, but also being sensitive to some of the disparities as it relates to individuals that are seeking care, um, the stigma attached as well. Um, so I think that, that that is a unique opportunity and certainly the tech aspect does help when it comes to things like social determinants of health, right? Because you're giving everybody access, ideally, right then and there. Yes, all really important considerations. So um, I wish we had more time, but I just have uh, one final question for you is, what are your hopes for the future in terms of how innovative mental health and well-being solutions can continue to evolve for employers and employees? I guess my hope is that it, it becomes a standard pillar of benefits that we are, we're talking about your medical carrier, your pharmacy benefits, your voluntary benefits and mental health, um, that it, it becomes that critical to the conversation around supporting employees and supporting business performance. Absolutely. I think that parity is so key here. Um, that mental health should be, and behavioral health should be just as important as physical health, um, as all the other things that, that Shira has been, been mentioning under the well-being umbrella. Um, but it's, it's clear, especially with the pandemic, that, that we're headed in that direction. And I just, I, my hope would be that we continue the momentum and that we really can um, kind of infiltrate the, the workplace um, and, and have it really become one of those key that's addressed. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, Shira, really a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for your expertise and time. Thank you.